Oh, hey. Thanks very much for tuning in uh, to the show today. So my guest um, doesn't really need much of an introduction, but hey, I'll do an introduction anyway. This is the introduction of the show. Um, her name is Irina Lutsenko, and she is um, pretty well known in um, the English teaching world. She's got a um, pretty um, well-known page, which obviously I'll, I'll do a link to in the description. Um, one of the great things about Irina and, and her page and her content is her focus on writing as well as speaking and, and general English study um, because writing is you know a really I wouldn't say undervalued but a really uh, underpresented shall we say skill um, and Irina um, finds a way to, to make it really interesting really engaging um, so you should definitely go and check her out if you're not subscribed already to her page uh, you've got to go and do that right now so um, without further ado um, I hope you enjoy the show Right, three, two, one. Irina Lutsenko. Hello, how are you hi, today? Hi, 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 Mike. I'm good, good, good. How are you? Yes, not too bad, not too bad. I, um, it's nice to meet you finally, by the way. This is, you this too. is the, the first time we've spoken. Well, not technically not the first time we've spoken. The first time we've spoken in English, so that's something. In English and in person. Well, kind of in person. Yeah. Yeah, so it was in Russian and in text previously, and now in English and in person. So that's great. Yeah, I've um, I'm I'm on my third cup of coffee of the day. I don't know why I do this to myself. It's completely self-inflicted torture. But I we tape the show on a on a Sunday at nine o'clock. I've no idea why. <laughs> oh, I have a very good idea why. <laughs> also, don't, you know, you need to uh, you kind of rephrase. It's not torture. Pleasure. Yeah, well, I mean, it's um, it's amazing how uh, how often those two coincide, eh? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't have time to do this in the week because I obviously got my speaking club and then I have you know um, another full time job <laughs> that I work. So uh, even though today is supposed to be Shabbat for me, I'm uh, yeah I'm taping this show. So, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. What what do you do? Um, What's all your content all, all about? Um, <gasps> what stuff do you teach? It's the most difficult question. Tell me a bit about yourself. <laughs> um, yet I ask all of my, uh, all, all, the, all of the people I work with this exact same question, yet I'm not really prepared. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm a teacher of English as a foreign language, uh, as boring as it sounds, it's true. Uh, I specialize in exam preparation and I have a passion um, I love writing, so I teach writing a lot, yeah. um, writing for exams and a little bit writing for, you know, like blogging and stuff like that. Um, I, I like to think that I inspire people to write and I like to think that I inspire people to learn English, to be passionate about English, to learn vocabulary, to do something different, to do something new. Mm -hmm. Writing is a very interesting avenue um, to go down because um, I always talk about this with um, Volva from Advanced English. Um, shout out to Volva. Um, he is always complaining. Well, he's complaining in principle always, first of all, is what I need to say. But more specifically, he's always complaining about the lack of um, material for, for writing out there. And he said to me, because he helped me start up my speaking, speaking club, and he said to me, uh, look, you forget speaking. If you want to make an unbelievable amount of money, make a youtube channel about writing because there's nothing out there there's no preparation materials no no specialists in writing but it sounds like you are are doing sort of half exam preparation half creative writing have i got have i got that correct yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah well um, i was going to ask you a bit uh, more about that a bit later because it's uh, it's an interesting um an interesting what should we say uh, tributary for you to flow down but first of all i wanted to ask you the question which i'm sure is on everyone's minds uh, and I wanted to ask you most, what the hell is wrong with you? I'm okay. I'm going to read out a list here that I've written down: CPEA, IELTS Academic Nine, IELTS General Eight Point Five, to TOEFL One Hundred and Fifteen, courses in America, courses in the UK, professional blog. Why don't you stop? Why are you never satisfied? 
But I don't know why, I just have this drive inside that I somehow miraculously found and mm -hmm. I can't stop now. I can't. Yeah. No, just I'm keeps I'm, pushing me. I'm joking, of course, because I'm I'm the same type of mentally ill person as you are. Uh, I don't have quite as many strings to my bow or feathers in my cap uh, as you do in terms of qualifications. Uh, but yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. Thank you. Thank you. So, if if you had to choose Cambridge Main Suite or IELTS, what's your what's your desert island exam? If you if you had a one size fits all exam, which would you prefer to teach or to to take as a student? Oh, that's an impossible choice. You're putting me in the, in the, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, especially seeing as it was Vladimir who, <laughs> who, kind of, who made this referral and who introduced us. Um, uh, uh, mm, mm. IELTS. Yeah, yeah. I, here's the thing. IELTS is it's such a wide spectrum. It's supposed to be able to tell you anywhere between sort of, you know, low upper in slash intermediate to um, C2, um, but I don't know how accurately you can do that. So I think Cambridge is more accurate in terms of specifying exactly what your level is, but IELTS has a, a wide application if you want to get a visa, if you want to go and study. Um, what, what, do you, what do you think? Well, I think actually, you know, it's uh, I've taken three international exams and uh, my, my scores, they are always, uh, you know, comparable. They, if you compare the scales, they, they are the same. So my score is basically the same in any exam. That's why I think all of them uh, measure people's uh, English skills, people's English level uh, more or less equally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I'll have to get you on with a, a, little, a little debate with Vova because I, I don't think he agrees with you. I know, I know. <laughs> You should. It's, it's good that he's not here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, they do assess different skills. Uh, but if you work hard enough and if you you set your mind to it, you will succeed in any of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right then. Um, so let's go back to writing, shall we? Because um, what, one of the things that I love most about, by, by the way, I didn't even say the name of your page. Um, tell people where to find your page and what it's all about. Oh, on VK, it's uh, vk.com slash I-R-A-L-U-T-S-E. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very, um, it's just my name, basically, in short, Ira Lutze. And uh, Instagram, I think it's uh, ira.lutze.il. So I-R-A dot uh, L-U-T-S-E dot I-L-S. And when you say IRA, let's just be clear, we don't mean the Irish Republic. Uh, the, yeah. mean short for Irina. Yes, yes, well, yes. I, 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 I love Ireland. Yes, yes, yes. I don't want any violence in there. Hey, the, I, the IRA loves Ireland as well, but just in a more uh, bombastic way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things that I love, one of my favorite posts um, that you do is uh, Irina's Five. Um, do you want to go ahead and explain what that's all about? Because I do a similar thing, actually. Well, basically, I take, because I, there is a lot of vocabulary that I come across everywhere, um, and what I want to do is recycle this vocabulary, just make sure that it's in some kind of context. Um, so what I do is just, I weave them into one story, however ridiculous it might sound, um, just for the sake of practicing. Um, and uh, sometimes the vocabulary is new, something new that I learn, and sometimes it's just a phrase that I like that I realize I don't use very often. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, it just basically works like this. Um, the original intention was recycling vocabulary, but then it just turned into an exercise in uh, imagination. <laughs> it was fun. I was always kind of looking and thinking, how can I weave into uh, one story the word, um, I don't know, land yard and the word, um, which is very specific, it's an object, right, that you wear on your neck and something more abstract like um, anodyne, anodyne celebrity interview. So I was thinking, how can I do it? It's fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do something similar when I'm learning um, new vocabulary in Russian. I will um, not so often will I write a story uh, per se. I often try and write a poem. And again, it you know, like like your stories, you say it's just some sort of silly story. I, again, you know, obviously it's a poem, but not in my native language. Um, you know, even even more so. So it, it's complete nonsense. But it just getting some words to rhyme and and you know. Um, putting together some sort of some sort of um, narrative is yeah, a super super helpful way of, of learning. Yeah, um, vocab I think writing poetry is far more superior to writing this 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 short stories. I, I, I yeah. Well, I'll Heads just, off I'll, poetry. 
<laughs> well, you haven't read the, the nonsense that I write, so put that out <laughs> for the moment. But no, I'll only write short sort of quatrains, um, quatrains for, for people listening who uh, are not sort of, you know, super into poetry, which I, I completely understand. A quatrain is like this uh, four line poem. So I don't, are you, are you, you're a fan of poetry, aren't you, Irina? Not a fan, but yeah, I do like poetry, yeah. Oh. A little bit. Do you mostly read in English or in Russian if you're reading poetry? Oh, both, both. Mm -hmm. So if you know, um, I don't know if you know this sort of, you know, satirical poets, but people like um, uh, Gubirman, he, he published these short um, four line poems. Uh, he called them Gariki, obviously in honor of himself. And so he, um, you know, wrote a lot in the 1970s and the 1980s about um, you know, when he, he was in prison for essentially for dissident activities uh, and just these really, um, um, you know, like, something I've, I've often found about writing is that brevity is so important. If you can express, um, you know, this idea, um, this um, really, you know, sort of quick witted um, concept in, in a short space, it really blows my socks off when I, when I read that sort of stuff. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what sort of stuff do you like to read? Textbooks? Textbooks, yes, and articles. Uh, because I like, you know, I always, uh, when I read them, I always evaluate them or in terms of, can I use it in class? Mm. <laughs> it's awful, actually. I, I, I read for pleasure very, very rarely. Um, well, that said, I, I started reading The Lord of the Rings on Vladimir's, Vladimir's recommendation. Oh my God, he is obsessed with that book. Yeah. <laughs> he never shuts up, but honestly. So when um, Vladimir was, was a student of mine for a while, and um, so we had some lessons over the summer, and I realized that he had this sort of mental illness regarding Lord of the Rings. And for like three lessons, I didn't need to prepare anything. I just said, okay, Bob, tell me about Lord of the Rings. And he would just, for an hour and a half, just not shut up about Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, he loves it. He loves it. And The Hobbit too. Um, so yeah, he's um, he's pretty he's pretty fun. Yeah, we'll see. The first non-fiction book I've, I've read in years, unfortunately. Non-fiction. Non-fiction. You mean fiction? Fiction. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, it's not a Freudian sleep. You see. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Non-fiction so, is all I read. What sort of like I, I'm I'm a big fan of non-fiction as well. I also have to um, force myself to every now and again read a bit of fiction because I'm just. I'm so curious about stuff that's happened in the real world. And I feel like if I'm reading fiction, then I'm going to miss out. Do you know what I mean? So what, what sort of things, what sort of topics do you like reading about? About, I don't know, um, politics, environment, um, art? Oh, uh, something like uh, personal growth, uh, success, how to be productive, how to be effective, how to uh, um, stuff like that. Mm. I have this book on my, on my, uh, on my desk about leadership. Oh, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> okay. And how? How can I how can I grow? How can I be productive? Uh, be yourself and pursue your passions. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess. I guess. I think it's um my theory with that kind of thing is um that you have so you have a certain input and you have a certain output so the output is is the results of your work the fruit that, that it bears the input can be something so simple as um okay when i plan my lesson um you know do i do it on the computer or do i write it down in a book when i um, get ready for class do i send a zoom link via email or do i do it via whatsapp just such small things like that but if you correct all of those little teeny tiny things, and if you get that right, and if you really focus on that, then the outputs, the results will just correct themselves. True, um, true. The devil's in the detail, yeah. It sure is, or he sure is. Or maybe she, I don't know, maybe the she. devil. <laughs> they. They, they, yeah, no, just, that's not, not going on to that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so... When you're um, reading, and I'm sure you read as well about, um, you know, um, development as a teacher, as, as, a, as, a, as a, a pedagogue, um, as I understand, you studied in, was it uh, Pskov that you studied in? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that my where you're hometown. From? My hometown, yeah. All right. Shout out to Pskov. Hello. Shout out to Pskov. Hi, everyone. Um, so, 
60, yeah, region 60. Was that, can you say it again? Region number 60. 60, yeah, yeah, wow. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I didn't even understand it because <laughs> I didn't, I, I, you know, this region numbers by heart. Yeah, I, I learned them all off. But so one of my hobbies, well, you'll like this actually, if you like sort of personal development and stuff, one of my hobbies is um, memory techniques. So mm -hmm. I would I would sort of train myself to, for example, memorize a deck of playing cards. Oh my God. And so you memorize 52 cards and I think my record was about 15 minutes, which is, that's nothing. That's really, that's so amateur compared to the professionals. Some people can do it in like four minutes. Uh, wow. which I um, but one of the things I decided to memorize was for no particular reason was all of the regions um, of, of the Russian Federation. So like, you know, for example, 72 is Jumin, but that's easy because I used to live there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I can catch someone like me off guard <laughs> this way, like a British person. Knows. <laughs> I wouldn't know what Tumen, uh, the number for Tumen is. No, I do now, but... Well, there you go. There you go. Um, but yeah, do you want to know the most interesting number? If you want to impress your friends at cocktail parties with your knowledge of Russian region numbers, <laughs> I'll tell you the most interesting number ever. 94. Which is what? So... This is gonna this is gonna blow your socks off. Um, Ninety four, technically speaking, is the number of any region outside the Russian Federation, but under the jurisdiction of um, and where they of Russia, which means uh, the only region that falls under yeah. is Baikonur, because Baikonur is technically in Kazakhstan, but it's controlled by Russia. So any sort of trucks or stuff or cars that are registered to Baikonur will be number ninety four. See what you know what <laughs> you sound like Sheldon. <laughs> <laughs> what annoying? <laughs> no, 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 no. A treasure trove of um interesting facts. Yeah, I think you mean useless facts, but uh yes, thank thank you very much, I guess. <laughs> so um reading about um as I say about um personal development and, and you know being being a good teacher, what if you had to summarize it, what for you makes a good teacher? Uh, a good teacher has their students' best interests in mind. And they, they, they really listen to what their students need and they pay close attention to what their students need. Um, because sometimes teachers, you know, they, they uh, go to a seminar, they read a book, uh, I don't know, the, you know, the lexical approach, and they become obsessed with something they read they totally forget about the students' needs and they try to apply something that's not really applicable in a certain situation uh, because no approach, uh, no seminar, no, you know, no, no method is, uh, you know, the, the end in itself and the ultimate good. So I think mm -hmm. this is what a good teacher is. Yeah, I think sometimes um, an, an, over, an over dependence on methodology can be, um, you know, just like like putting a stick in your bicycle spokes. Um, that's to say, it trips you up. Um, yeah, I tell me about the lexical approach. I, I've never used it. Do, are you a fan? Um, well, it sounds good <laughs> in theory. In practice, I don't. I don't know much about it. To be honest, I have a confession to make. I'm not a specialist on the lexical approach. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't really know. That's okay. Well, what, what's your what's your would you say that you have like one particular approach or you have one methodology or do you just, as you say, you, you, you plan your lesson according to your students' needs? Yeah, just my students' need, my students, um, I don't know, the, the, the areas they need to address, the goals they have. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all very well and good, but I'm sure you've had these students, as, as, as I'm sure all, all of, you know, I have and, and all of our colleagues have, what about when you get a student who does not know what he needs? I would maybe say, don't know what they need, but I think he is more accurate here because it's normally a man who does this, who says, okay, I need to get CP, he's elementary. I need to get CP in three months. Uh, what do I need to do? What do you do with people like that? Oh, no, no, I, I just, uh, I, I am blunt with people like that. Like it's not possible. Mm -hmm. But don't, don't, don't you have like students who, they they think they know what the best way is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe they're right who knows but how how do you try and course correct how do you how do you um you know tell a student that you know maybe you shouldn't be reading uh, lord of the rings cover to cover maybe start with a graded reader for example 
Uh, well, sometimes, you know, in different ways, sometimes uh, I, I might allow them to, I, I might say, well, go ahead and read the Lord of the Rings. And when they start doing that, they realize they get bogged down in all this vocabulary. So mm -hmm. I, I give them the freedom to realize that uh, on their own, that it's not the best way. It's just, you, you might spend uh, 30 minutes in class discussing one word, and then they highlighted 50 words in one, in, in one chapter. So what's the point in that? Uh, sometimes I try to reason with them and I explain why a certain thing might not be good for them. I might demonstrate uh, with the help of some examples. Um, and sometimes I just um, I say no to people like that. If, if they don't have a specific goal and I talk to them a little in mm. messages and then I might say, no, I'm not your teacher. Mm. Okay, pretty harsh. Pretty harsh. Well, <laughs> because, you know, I have so, so much experience, so many years uh, under my belt, so I kind of see immediately that we are not a fit. Let's, let's not waste our time. I'm not the best teacher in the world. Come on, you can find another teacher. So Don't say that, Irina. You are the best teacher in the world. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you different. You go get them, girl. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, so... As regards, um, so when you're teaching um, a student for, you know, for a particular exam, um, I've always been torn between this because as far as I'm concerned, the best way to pass whatever exam it is, whether it's CAE, IELTS, TOEFL, CPE, um, is to keep practicing English, keep, you know, general yeah. English practice. Yeah. And then at the last second, just dust a little bit like that Turkish butcher uh, with some exam format yeah. knowledge. How, but I, I don't know whether I've got the right balance there. How much of being successful in a Cambridge exam is knowledge of English and how much of it is knowing the exam format and knowing the tricks and tips, etc.? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not a believer in uh, tips and tricks generally. Uh, I think any exam, success in any exam is 90% uh, English. The format, you can master. 10%, yeah, you can master the format in what? I don't know, one month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, returning to the, the issue of Cambridge versus IELTS, or Cambridge Main Suite, I should say, versus IELTS, um, do you get the feeling that one of those exams more than the other, um, you would benefit from learning the format a little bit? No, I'm not sure. Well, uh, again, I have a confession to make. Um, CPE is really the only exam I know. Um, I mean, I know a little bit. I, I have uh, some idea of what the other exams are, that they're more, more or less similar to CPE, but I, I don't, I'm not sure I know them. Yeah, they, well. they, they are similar. But I mean, so with me, I've always got the impression that um, IELTS is one of those exams where it's, it's a lot more about knowing the format than Cambridge Main Suite exams, for example. If you know how to approach an IELTS question, and so, for example, in um, you, I, you'll be able to tell me I'm not a, not a specialist with IELTS, but um, you, that part of the exam where you get a diagram and you have to explain, what's, yeah. for example, here's a yeah. diagram of a nuclear reactor, explain what's going on. Like there, there are certain tip, tricks and tips and how to structure it. So you start off with a general description, then you talk about the process and then you do blah, blah, blah. Don't you think that IELTS is one of those exams where you really need to know what you're doing before you start? Not really. Uh, that said, you're right about writing task one. Writing task one is something people never ever do in their general English classes uh, when they learn English. That's why they really need to be, it's, it's not about the, the you know, knowing the tricks, it's more about not being um, completely surprised and taken off guard and paralyzed by what you see, by, by mm -hmm. knowing what to expect. That's, that's tr true. Uh, that said, I mean, Cambridge, um, in CB, for example, you have to know, uh, like, uh, if you have a question, write a book review. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to know what a book review looks like, more or less. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's true of a lot of exams where, um, when you open, so uh, task one, yeah, when you have this picture, 
um, when, when you open up the exam and there's a picture of a nuclear reactor and you're like, oh my God, I don't know anything about nuclear reactors. Well, as it happens, I personally do because I'm, I'm very interested in nuclear energy, but that's, you know, whatever, okay, a picture of a picture of a trombone. Oh my God, I don't know anything about trombones, but then you need to calm down and realize that there's always a way. They wouldn't have given you a picture. Yeah, you are not supposed to know. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So here's the, um, <laughs> the shock content part of the podcast. Um, so I wanted to get your thoughts on this. Um, what shall we say? Um, bubble of um, controversy that's uh, sprung up, that's mushroomed up in the, in the um, English teaching world of late. Uh, so I noticed that you reposted uh, a blog post by... Uh. Uh -huh. um, what's the guy's name? Hudella. Hudella. Uh -huh. um, about this, um, the idea of native native speakerism, mm -hmm. um, of, of um, you know, sort of uh, what did he call it? Positive discrimination towards um, people who are native speakers. So I'm I'm not going to comment. I wanted to get your two cents on that. What's what's your whole opinion of this um, of this issue? <sighs> Uh, well, <laughs> you have to ask a more specific question. Uh, my opinion is that I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be um, uh, candid. Uh, I do want to sound like a native speaker. Uh, that's my standard, however unattainable it is. Uh, at the same time, I realize it's not possible. I'm very aware that I have an accent. Uh, I'm ver very aware that uh, I might be using wrong, wrong, you know, prepositions or collocations sometimes, and I don't beat myself up about that. Um, so I would say that maybe we should have this standard in ourselves uh, as, a, as a hypothetical standard, unattainable standard, but we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves for not being able to achieve it. Um, when it comes to teaching, I think many people have now come to realize that a native speaker and a teacher are just two different things. And that they are not uh, uh, necessarily, I mean, they can coincide sometimes, but they're just two different things. And um, mm -hmm. a lot of people have seen native speakers who were extremely bad teachers. They didn't know what to do. Uh, they just came to Russia, for example, to, to have fun. And, and uh, Yeah, I, I know a lot of people like that. Um, and that, that's, that's one reason why um, you know, I, I, I took my responsibility very seriously um, because, yeah, you're right. I think a lot of the, and I've, I've said this before about in previous episodes about like the communicative method and how I think it's a lot of the time it's, it's an excuse for people who are native speakers of English, but who are not necessarily well-educated, who are not necessarily qualified, who are not necessarily, frankly speaking, intelligent people. Uh, mm -hmm. You think they can just then go and, and sure, you can correct someone's pronunciation and you can say, um, that's not how we say it. We say it like this mm -hmm. and then give no further explanation. That's why I, I, I take my responsibility as a teacher very, very seriously. I, I want to know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. and I want to demonstrate to my students that, you know, I, I, I understand what I'm talking about and here's, here's why. Um, at the same time, though, yeah, there, there are, and there, there are, you know, examples of, and I, I aspire to be this kind of teacher, someone who is a native speaker and who also can back up what they're saying with, with the, the appropriate knowledge. Um, and, and of course, you know, there, there are definitely um, Russians uh, and, and people of all nationalities who also have that level of, uh, and definitely superior knowledge to, to mine, certainly. But there's also, as you say, native speakers who are, who are, think they can just rock up with a suitcase and and um, and, and a you know a credit card and just you know start teaching, but it doesn't work yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um. But, but this is this is where I think um, Hugh Deller in his blog post was, was, frankly speaking, being a little bit, a little bit silly was saying something like this positive discrimination towards native speakers is toxic. So it, it sounds like a bit like virtue signaling to me. Um, a bit like, you know, that, that's, that's silly. There is definitely, there's a reason why some people might want to study with a native speaker. You can't call that discrimination. I'm sorry, but if, if you have a, a teacher who happens to be a native speaker and, um, 
you know, knows what they're talking about and is a competent teacher, then of course there's a, you know, like if I was going to go and study Russian again, I'm sorry, I wouldn't go and, I wouldn't go and ask an English person. I would go and find a Russian native speaker. It's not discrimination. I think you, you have the right to, uh, I mean, to, to want whatever you want. Uh, but then, um, I also, I want to, I, I think the word toxic is a very strong word because I, as I was reading this, this was very, it's, it's not certainly not the world I live in. Mm. And I, I certainly have not, I have, I have always had students. My students, you know, have always had a lot of good words about me. They thanked me uh, profusely. So I kind mm. of, yeah, it might exist in theory, but um, oh, I don't know, maybe toxic is it's a bit, you know, he's being over dramatic. But then again, it's not the context that I live in. Maybe in other countries, it's the case. Maybe, I think, um, yeah, in, in, in Russia, not so much these days, but certainly, you know, back in the day, I think pe people kind of like, you know, their, their eyes bulged, especially, you know, living in Siberia, um, when they, they'd see what their native speakers who live here in Chumi, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that sort of, you know, sort of level of shock um, that that contributed towards this whole problem that people would just, you know, come to your class because, oh, they're a native speaker. They must know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. But as I say, I, I, I think that there is an emerging middle class in Russia. The Russian market is changing. And it's true about China as well, about Latin America to a lesser extent, these sort of growing um, middle class um, societies where, where Russian consumers are, are not going to put up with that anymore. Russian, they will see this guy yeah. is rocked up from America, has no idea what yeah. he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, sorry, I'm going to go and study with Vova. I'm going to go and study with Irina because yeah. they yeah. actually know what they're talking about. Yeah. So the consumers dictate the market. There is a sort of free market society in Russia. So, um, yeah, I don't think people are put up with it anymore. It's true. They don't. They don't. Yeah, it's, it, we can think of people as, you know, kind of, a, I don't know, a herd of sheep who just follow whatever, uh, you know, whatever carrot someone is waving at them. Uh, no, no, no. They can tell the difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah for sure. For sure. Okay, then. Um, yeah, I am... Um, I think as well, what, what this has to do with is um, knowledge of L1, um, that's to say students' native language. I mean, I, I, would, I would have a much tougher time if I were teaching a classroom full of, let's say, um, Chinese-speaking learners or um, German-speaking learners. I would have a really tough time teaching that class because I very often I will use Russian in the classroom, not super often, but sometimes. Um, and the, the, you know, sort of knowing mm -hmm. why someone's making that yeah, mistake. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. It's super helpful. I mean, do, do you, do you, first of all, do you use uh, Russian in the classroom? And second of all, um, have you had any experience of teaching non-Russian speakers? Uh, Russian is prohibited in my classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never use it. And I, my students are prohibited from using it. If they ask me to translate, I don't. I ignore their requests. Uh, I do have experience of uh, teaching, preparing some people for IELTS, people, uh, someone from Argentina, someone from India. Yeah, some, some other nationalities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Why is Russian prohibited in you? Are you uh, some sort of Russophobe? <laughs> No, because I think translation is the uh, the root of um, ninety nine percent of mistakes. Interesting. You, what you mean, like um, translation is the root of mistakes. So you mean what people mistranslating things in their head, and then yeah, yeah, and then they become so used to it, they rely on this so much that they don't check for collocations, they don't check, they don't even think for collocations. They just think I will translate it, and it's fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do see what you're saying. I think there's a time and a place to use Russian. Um, it's the, the, the time and place is not during speaking practice. So, for example, when I have um, when I do my speaking club or whatever, we're doing speaking practice in a regular class. Um, I, yeah, of course, we, will not um, allow people to speak Russian because um, as, as you know, my favorite phrase goes, um, you know, you, your brain has to understand there's no plan B. You've got yeah, to say this. Yeah, exactly. Say exactly. It. Exactly. But I mean, I I would still say that 
so I mean, I, I love language. That's, that's my, my sort of passion. And when there's a super interesting parallel between this is how we say it in English, this is how it's said in Russian, and, you know, looking at the, you know, the stories of where these words come from and the derivation and the etymology, isn't that, isn't that worth talking about in class? I think it's super interesting. It might be. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying, um, like, I, I found upon translation in my class, um, because I've seen so many uh, um, negative effects of this, so I don't do it. It's, you know, for me, it's just easier to prohibit it rather than uh, kind of go into this lengthy debate of, oh, it was useful in that time, but it was not useful in another uh, case. So, it's, it's because students kind of need this, this habit, it's just they speak English, that's it. Uh, you're right, absolutely. And different people are different. You know, some people use, uh, it's, this, it's just a matter of preferences. People have preferences in terms of using um, approaches, course books, um, I don't know, dic online dictionaries. It's yeah. just not something I do. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't want to vilify translation. Mm -hmm. I noticed as well from your uh, page that you also studied uh, German, was it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How is it German these days? Is it like my Spanish? No, no, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing it is. I, I, have a, I have a diploma which says I'm a teacher of German. I haven't spoken it for 16 years, so mm, no, no. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how quickly you forget, because I, I, so I did Russian and Spanish at university. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's unless you keep all of those plates spinning at the same time, by the way, that's not how you spin plates for anyone watching the video. Um, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I spent um, my, my year abroad, in my third year at university, I spent in Russia entirely. And then I came back, tried to speak a word of Spanish and it just comes out in Russian. Yeah. Can't yeah. stop. Um, and these days, yeah, I mean, I, I would really struggle to have a conversation in Spanish these days. I used to speak it, you know, pretty fluently to a high standard and, and my, I did my dissertation in naval history. So I was working with, you know, 18th century text and, you know, things from military archives. So, you know, I, I knew a thing or two in Spanish, but these days just all gone. Yeah, yeah. Use it or lose it. Use, yeah, use it or, as you correctly say, lose it. Um, did you find that studying German, having said that, gave you... Um, you know, a, a different perspective on English, because they are, of course, um, closely related languages. Not really. I don't think so. No? Mm. Well, I think it's interesting to observe, um, you know, those words which are of Germanic origin, so sort of like Anglo-Saxon um, words, and those which came later with the Norman invasion. So when the Normans invaded, uh, in 1066 and, and brought across all of their Latinate words. It's very interesting to, to see um, where those divides are in... in... So do, do you know about that, you know, the, the one that people, the example that people always give about names for animals and names for meats? The example? So this is an example of um, Anglo-Saxon derived words and Latin de derived words. So in most languages, um, you know, if you, you take, um, you know, take Russian, for example, the word for an animal and the word for the meat that it gives us are almost always the same root. Um, so, you know, think about like, you know, so the only example would, uh, that's different in Russian would be Gavyadina, but that that's explained because it comes from Gavyada, which is, you know, still a, a good old uh, Slavic root. Um, but in English, look at these examples. You have cow, beef sheep, mutton, um, you know, deer, venison, and so on and so forth. And what do you notice? All of the words which are about an animal are all Germanic. Cow, pig, sheep, deer, they're all Anglo-Saxon words. And all of the words which are meat, so mutton is from the French word mouton, which just means sheep. Uh, beef, again, is, is a French root. Um, venison, a Latinate root. So what do we notice? That Think about the, the, the Anglo-Saxon peasants, the working class, who were looking after these animals. Of course, they use their Germanic words. Now, if you are some, you know, French lord who's just invaded England, the only time that you have a dealing with an animal is when it's on the table as, as a prepared meal. So they use their French words. And to this day, we still have that social, uh, socio-linguistic split. 
which is pretty cool. It is, it is, it is fascinating. And you know, the history of the language, we studied stuff like that at university. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. About English or about Russian as well? English, English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I find super interesting is, is, is words that, uh, doublets they call them. So uh, I'm sure you studied doublets at university as well. Um, words that have taken different journeys and then ended up in different parts of, of the world. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I think, I think so. I can think of an example. So one, uh, one of my favorite examples is um, Boganko. In, so Boganko for, for, for you guys is, is, a, is a mushroom, bad little mushroom. <laughs> um, so we, let's look at where this word comes from. So originally, this comes from uh, pegus in Latin. Pegus means like field or village or whatever. Um, so from that, you um, you get this um, Slavonic root like uh, porgen. And that means originally meant uh, like izichnik, izichstwa. It was associated with that, which in English we say, of course, pagan. Pagan. So for you, it's a mushroom. For us, pagan is like this Yazidic person. Um, but yeah, super interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I talked about that in my mushroom video, <laughs> which I did the other day. <laughs> you have a mushroom video. Oh yeah, I got loads of mushroom videos. No, I've only got one. Um, but yeah, we, we did um, different, ha how to say different mushrooms in English. And um, I didn't know many of them <laughs> because oh. we don't really collect mushrooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I learned a, chanterelles at one point. It was fascinating. It sounds so beautiful, chanterelles. Chanterelles. Um, you see, Chikim? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, fox See, I, I would know it in Russian. Foxes, yeah, you're tiny yeah, fox. <laughs> I have no idea what it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> another interesting example is when this process of two words going to, along different paths, when it happens in the same language, that is super, super interesting. So one of my favorite examples is, so um, good old Russian word, izvist. Okay, so izvist is a word that has, comes from Greek originally and it spent, you know, hundreds of years evolving and changing and going through old church Slavonic into modern Russian. And then we get this word izvist, yeah? So originally, let's look at where that comes from, the root, of that word in Greek is zbestos, and zbestos in Greek means extinguish, yeah? So like to, to put out a fire. Um, if we put the negative prefix at the beginning of that, a plus zbestos, asbestos, then it means unextinguishable, which, you know, is why they're called izvis, this unextinguishable name. Now, you probably already guessed what's the second word. If we take that word, directly from Greek, then we get the, the, the good old Russian word asbiast. So asbiast or asbiastos and izvist are one and the same word. Pretty cool, right? It is, it is absolutely. Well, you see, it's a whole, um, yeah, yeah. Do you often get to teach that? Because it's a whole new field. You can take the, you know, you know teach a whole course based on that. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, do I often get to teach that? Um, well, I mean, when I sort of, you know, forced the class to listen to me ranting about language for, <laughs> for hours on end, sure. But um, it is it is super interesting because um, you've got to ask, why are those words so different? If it's one word, why are they different? Well, because the, in the first situation, um, you have a word which has undergone hundreds and hundreds of years of linguistic evolution, which is why, you know, easiest, it looks like a, it's like a super Russian looking word, yeah? Um, as guest, on the other hand, mm -hmm. we, we forewent all of that um, evolutionary process and, we, you know, we just went and took it straight from Greek. So that's why the words look so different. Yeah. Now, that being the case, what you very often find with these types of linguistic doublets is that the, the the first word which has undergone all this evolution that normally describes something which is um you know quite physical pedestrian um and which is you know has been used for a lot so you know is this your lime in english by the way lime um is used you know historically in a lot of you know building materials and stuff whereas um asbestos is quite a modern 
technology. It was invented, what, the 1950s? So they, um, you know, just took it straight from uh, ancient Greek. So you find that the, the word which is taken from the language wholesale, which is stolen from an ancient language, normally describes something more scientific, more academic. Yeah. Um, and a good example in English as well is things like, um, so you have um, the adjective from sun could be sunny. So, you know, that that's a very old word, sunny weather, sunny disposition, for example. But then if you want to talk about radiation or you want to talk about orbit. Solar. Solar. Solar so activity. Sunny mm -hmm. is an Anglo-Saxon root and solar is just taken straight from Latin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these divides are very, very old divides, still here today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the same word in English. This is the reason why the same word in English will have several different uh, synonyms, like uh, stomach, uh, abdomen. <laughs> belly. <laughs> one of the, belly. One of them is bound to be Latin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, abs and that's um, be because we have so many, um, you know, etymological antecedent languages, that's one of the reasons that makes um, you know English so vast in its vocabulary mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. varied. I mean, that's why we can say big or huge. That's why we can say small or little, uh, or you know, or large as well would be another example. Um, so yeah, it's also what makes English very um, annoying for people learning it because a the spelling system is completely kaput, and uh, there's there's a lot of words to learn. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So when my students ask me what's the hardest thing about learning English, it's vocabulary, endless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's it's non-stop but if it makes you feel any better um i have the same feeling about russian i still uh, come across words every day which i've never seen before but with russian it's um i i've talked about this before in the podcast about how it's it's um i very much feel it's like a lego language and that um like you can see a word that you've never seen before and uh, instantly understand what it means um, which I, I, I don't, do you have that same feeling with English? Uh, sometimes I do, but only because I learned Latin, we learned Latin at university. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's, if it's a Latin word, uh, yeah, I will know. But other than that, guess what? Even if it's a German word though? German maybe, yeah, yeah. Spanish, you know, something uh, similar, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. All right. Um, Ira, we've been going for about three quarters of an hour. So, um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's a good place to, to wrap it up on on that uh, asbestos ridden note. Um, thank you so much for your time. And thank you. Thank you so much. This was. A, yeah. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. That's great. Well, we'll have we'll have to do it again sometime. And uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the description so everyone go and check out Irina's page and uh, all you. of that uh, fun stuff. You do <laughs> writing content, I'll do my speaking content, and together we can do a speaking writing marathon of some kind. Ultimate, okay. yeah, ultimate, I don't know, something, ultimate marathon, so oh, that everyone... Extreme yeah. marathon of speaking and yeah. writing. Yeah. Com, for, for, the, for the brave, <laughs> <laughs> for the resilient, <laughs> yeah. Resilience marathon on ice. Yeah. Com. I wonder how many uh, participants <laughs> we will attract. Three? You know, I can tell you zero <laughs> participants. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could do some sort of extreme sports version of an English exam. You've got to, because you know they have that thing like chess boxing where you do a round of boxing and then you play 10 minutes of chess. We could do like, um, I don't know, extreme sports version of English. You have to do a bungee jump and a skydive and then do an IELTS <laughs> part two. Yeah, and then write a line grab description. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ, only not that, please. That's okay. even more extreme than, uh, than bungee jumping. The ultimate test. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. All right. Thank you so much. And, thank you. Um, Have I a wonderful day. Yeah, you too. I'll see you when I see you. Thank Bye you. Now. See you. Bye.